Like, oh, apparently she did something right. It, it's like vampire crack. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe vampire plumber's crack. <laughs> mm. That's not mm. quite as good. I'm not told. quite. <laughs> We're going to wait on the um, on our engineer to make sure that recording is underway and we're ready to go. He'll give us the thumbs up when it's time to get okay. ready. So this is pre-show time. Recording okay. is underway. Ooh. Recording is underway, but I decided to load lower third, so give me another second. All right. Um, this, is, this is This Week in Something? This Week in Something, pre-show. One of, one of these <laughs> This Weeks, This week. This is like the tailgate party for This Week in Science. Be right back. Okay. And <clears throat> Twit like, no, I we like having an engineer. It's good. It's great. What's everyone in the IRC doing? Are you having a good time in there? Waiting it up? We're 10 minutes late, aren't we? <laughs> Sorry to make you wait. The anticipation must be painful. <laughs> All right. Let's Scott, see. Scott so... just had to step away to write another book. He'll be, he'll be right back. <laughs> That's as long as it takes. Boom, done. Just like that. That's right. <laughs> Work on it. Okay. I'm going to, it looks like the uh, set of lower thirds was overwritten, so I'm going to be creating them on the fly. We will Ooh. start whenever you're ready. You are going to be the magic man creating all those things. Okay. Uh, Justin, so you start the show. So if we're ready to go, we can start, give it a, a five, four, three, two, one. If you want to go. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following hour programming deals exclusively with truth. Whose truth, what truth, and from which perspective the truth is being presented is an inherently subjective tangle of rhetorical reality. The word truth is only a metaphor for an argument. An argument resolved by an irrefutable consensus of opinion. But whose opinion? What opinion? And for which consensus the opinion is being derived can so drastically alter a truth as to make it unflatteringly refutable. Just calling a thing true or not true can create an argument. Turning the metaphor for an argument into an argument about metaphors. And while some metaphors are held to be self-evident, the physical universe never is. If we seek truth about the physical universe, we need to start by arguing with it. Once the argument is started, we hope a consensus can be found. Whether that consensus is cosmic or quantum, it is of relativity no concern. For if the truth be told, all you really need is This Week in Science, coming up next. Kirsten. Good Monday, Justin. So great good to see you Mondays. here. <laughs> it's good. You, you came up with something to start the show with. I like that. It works. Morning, evening, Monday. It's the day of the Monday. day for science. It is. So welcome everybody to this week's episode of This Week in Science. Today, we have a great show ahead, but don't we always? But today, it's even better. Because in addition to all the science news that we normally bring you, we have a special guest, Scott Sigler. Woo! Hello, hello. How are you guys? Hey, great. It's great to have you here. Famed New York Times bestselling author, author of such thrilling books as Ancestor, Infected, The Rookie. You're joining us here today to, in your own words, bring the smacketh down upon science. Got to be some science smack thing downing. That's what's going to go on today. I'm ready. Wow. I'm ready for it. <laughs> yes. All I know, yes. this should be pretty fun. And uh, we've interviewed you several times in years yes. past about different books. But this week, we decided to shift it up a little this year and not just ask you questions. 
You're now I get to actually make fun of science myself. And that's, that's always a good thing. Absolutely. So right. you're ready? I'm ready to roll. Let's do this. Awesome. So as far as the science goes, I brought stories about life on Titan, engineering black holes, and a good diet for the planet. Justin, what do you have? Well, while you're uh, doing your first story today, Kirsten, I'll be looking for my first story. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten, I've gotten, uh, let's see, I've got an outlaw blob. I've got Doomsday in Death Valley, another good reason not to kill yourself, and why all teenagers are insane. We've always wanted to know that. <laughs> Scott, you brought a couple of stories as well, didn't I you? I did. I did. I brought the uh, bald beast of KI. And mm -hmm. then I am also talking about life technologies investing in the work of Dr. Frankenstein. So those are two actual genuine stories. I'm really excited to hear both of them. It's science. Thanks. Science, people. So let's get it on. For those of you viewing live, I invite you to join the chat at the Twit IRC. It's a chat room, irc.twit.tv. And I'll do what I can to bring your comments into the discussion when I can see them and catch them. But if I, that doesn't work, just talk amongst yourselves. And now the news. So is Titan teeming with life? The headlines seem to say so, but we don't really know for sure. And that's pretty much the news. We think maybe, possibly, it's a hypothesis. It's an idea, but no evidence really supporting life for sure yet. I'd like to thanks, thank uh, Gord McLeod uh, for the Ars Technica story tip. But there's a uh, an original press release from uh, JPL, NASA itself. Basically, they say that to date, methane-based life forms are purely hypothetical. And the, to exist, these methane-based life forms, they don't exist with water the way that life forms, carbon-based life forms here on Earth do, they uh, would have to use methane and so, or, or the other, um, other carbon-based organic molecules that would stay liquid at the temperatures at which Titan currently is, which is like minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit, kind of cold. Uh, so the list of candidates is li liquid methane or ethane, something like that, but water is not part of it. In 2004, there was a researcher named Benner and his colleagues, they suggested that li the liquid hydrocarbons like methane and ethane on Titan, they could be the basis for life. And they could play the role that water does here on Earth. So that idea first was circulated in 2004, so only about six years ago. The researchers pointed out that in many senses, hydrocarbon solvents are better than water for managing complex organic chemical reactivity. In 2005, there were a couple of more, a couple more papers that came out. Uh, one of the researchers, Chris McKay, who's actually commented on uh, the Cassini missions website about the recent stuff, the recent research, his one of his papers in 2005 said that uh, if the available energy is available for methanogenic life based on the consumption of both the org organics and Titan's atmosphere, along with hydrogen in the atmosphere, they made the case that hydrogen on Titan would be like oxygen is here on Earth, which is pretty interesting. Um, so 2005, McKay and his colleague, Heather Smith, they suggested that methane-based life on Titan could consume hydrogen, acetylene, and ethane. And the last line of the abstract said, the result of the recent Huygens probe would indicate the presence of such life by anomalous depletions of acetylene and ethane, as well as hydrogens at the surface. And so suddenly this week, there seems to be evidence for all three of these things on Titan. So uh, a group led by a researcher named Clark has reported that there are depletions of acetylene at the surface of Titan. And it's uh, been appreciated for several years that there's not as much ethane as expected on the surface of Titan. And now another group led by a guy named Strobel predicts that there's a really strong flux of hydrogen into the surface so that hydrogen is, is starting at the outside of the atmosphere and then falling, floating downward to the surface. And, uh, and it's, all, it's all kind of fitting together in exactly the same way that the McKay paper predicted in 2005. So this is why everybody's jumping on it and going, whoa, life on Titan. But um, here's, where, here's where it kind of gets a little sticky is that um, 
uh, McKay actually says that the hydrogen evidence, it, it's not the result of direct observation. So it's the result of a computer simulation that's designed to fit measurements of hydrogen con concentrations in the lower and upper atmosphere in a self-consistent way. So the results could definitely change be altered or be different if that model doesn't work out right if they don't actually uh if if the, the this flux is just a model it's not actually potentially what's really happening there so we need to actually do more measurements to make sure that we know what's going on um and so mckay gives four possibilities for the recently reported findings listed in their order of likely realities number one the determination that there is a strong flux of hydrogen into the surface is completely mistaken. Uh, so other researchers need to duplicate what Strobel has done to see if the same results come out. Number two, there is a physical process that is transporting hydrogen from the upper atmosphere into the lower atmosphere. And he suggests that one possibility is adsorption onto the solid organic atmospheric haze particles, which eventually fall to the ground. And this would be a flux of hydrogen and not a net loss. Number three, if the loss of hydrogen at the surface is correct, the non-biological explanation requires that there be some sort of surface catalyst that can mediate hydrogenation reactions at 95 Kelvin or 290 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit, really cold. And that um, is not something that is, would, is currently known. We don't know what that compound would be. And the fourth... And final option, he says, you know, least likely to, to occur is that the depletion of hydrogen, acetylene, and ethane is now due to a new type of liquid methane-based life form as predicted. Hmm. So, so that's where we are right now. I think we need to send somebody to the surface of Titan. Go dig it up a little bit. I'll go. <laughs> I'll do it. I'm in, yeah, you I'm, ready? I, I'm in. I'm in. So I, I think Titan's a logical place for us to go immediately. And they have ruled out cows for this, correct? <laughs> yeah, I don't think they'll send cows first. Maybe, oh. I don't know, maybe. Can I have all your stuff? <laughs> Just going to leave. <laughs> yeah, it's all yours, buddy. It's all yours. It's, short, it's a all short right. trip. It's like going down to the store to get some milk. I'll be back in an hour. Don't worry about it. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll make sure nothing gets sold. <laughs> You'll make sure. You'll make Did sure. Did you say sold or stole? Wait. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I, I wonder, I, I personally wonder, like, life, if the life that could possibly be there. I know that, that McKay is saying it's probably the least likely possibility of it. He's being the, I don't know, the scientist and, you know, putting every... Scientists is always like, okay, let's let's think about this a little bit. I don't know. And so he's saying it's the least likely option. But if it were to be true, would it be, what kind of life would it be? Bacterial? Would it be like the methane, uh, the, the, there are methane produ producing bacteria here on earth. Not that we found any that actually exist off of methane, but I don't know. Would they, and if it were viral, like without, uh, if it were just like a virus or something, I mean, what can, what is, what is the life that we will accept? Well, it's, I mean, the basics, uh, it's self-replicating and it's going through some kind of, some kind of, um, you know, biological process, respiration, anything like that. I don't think people are going to be too picky at this point. The, re the religious side has to be very picky. That's not life, no matter what you come up with scientific side i think it'd be pretty tickled just about just about anything i don't know what do you think i won't i won't accept anything that can't tell a joke yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have a sense of humor i won't consider it uh, living if it can't tell a joke that would probably uh, that's my cutoff that cuts off um a lot of people i know exactly <laughs> but justin it doesn't cut off your biofuel biofuel poo story from last week because i think that's inherently its own joke it's a poo joke so i think that counts as life <laughs> poo jokes are always fun i don't care who we are there's another, if, there's, there's, if, there's a, if it's an inherently like if it doesn't have a sense of humor and can't tell a joke but looks really funny i think that would qualify i mean <laughs> if i see it and it makes me laugh i'm like okay that's a lot that's a, that's a life that's a living creature yeah. gotta be good to that one <laughs> 
There's a so, on the on the other end of the the methanogens and the uh, the beginnings of life and what allows life to take place to take place. There was another study that kind of links to this in a in a oblique way. A uh, paper in Science suggests that an atmosphere filled with organic molecules similar to what we see on Titan might have insulated the, our young planet Earth, keeping it from freezing and incubating early molecular life. So that when the sun wasn't putting off as much radiation, the Earth would have been colder. But um, because we were had an insulating atmosphere full of organic molecules that were able to bounce light, radiate life, light away and to keep anything, any heat and light that made it in, that it could have incubated it. The authors Wolf and Toon say... The Archaean Earth, that's 3.8 to 2.5 billion years ago, was probably enshrouded by a photochemical haze composed of fractal aggregate hydrocarbon aerosols. The fractal structure of the aerosols would have had a strong effect on the radiative properties of the haze. And they add the haze would have provided a strong shield against ultraviolet light while causing only minimal anti-greenhouse cooling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I just love the uh, enshrouded by a photochemical haze composed of fractal aggregate hydrocarbon aerosols. I mean, I don't know. That's a Grateful I Dead concert. Um, <laughs> exactly. I, went to a, I went to a Grateful Dead concert once and I was surrounded by a photochemical haze. I assure you. <laughs> it made the show very interesting. So if that's science, yay science. Yay science. That's right. Enshrouding the stadium as well as the earth and um, promoting life somehow. It's all good. It, 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 all the good. People seem to be alive, at least at this show. Uh, the people selling goulash outside out of a five gallon pickle barrel. Uh, that's got to be life. I thought, I think that qualifies because it was funny looking going back to Justin's. Point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah, I wonder that the what's going on on Titan. If the if the sun were to ever get brighter, stronger, heat things up a little bit more further out as it expands, I guess it'll expand and then eventually cool again. But it'll it'll expand and burn stuff up for on a way on its way out. I wonder if there'll be any point if there are little tiny building blocks of life on Titan, if they're the basics, if a heating up would allow it to uh, would allow that to evolve into something like what we have here, but methane based, but I guess it would change up. I, I, just an interesting idea. Maybe. I don't know. I'm just making right. stuff up. <laughs> so this is this story. This is a story actually here. I've got that. I was going to, I kind of had it on the back burners, but, uh, after, uh, some of the comments in the, uh, in the forum for this show, I think it may become more urgent. There is a, a better reason now than ever not to kill yourself. Is if you if you needed, uh, <laughs> there's no reason not to do it. This may be it. They uh, studied 1.1 million men uh, who had their IQs measured in early adulthood. Of that group, almost 18,000 attempted uh, to end their life at some point, which uh, required hospitalization. So they went back and they looked at the numbers. They adjusted for factors such as age, socioeconomic status, and they found that the men with the lowest IQ scores we're by far the most likely to attempt suicide. So, <laughs> how does this factor in for extreme sports, though? Because those guys, those guys are in the hospital a lot, and you know maybe like they're a, they look like they're trying to kill themselves, no matter what they say. Are they? Are you yeah. just are you saying that they have a lower IQ than everybody else? They, they may just take the pride of having the broken bones because I know people like that. And, <laughs> and it's almost I almost think they're actually trying to get an extra scar, trying to break a bone that they haven't broken before just to prove that they can do it. You know, we all have goals things we try to do in this world. So, you know, some people, let's break every bone in my body and still be alive. <laughs> but yeah, this is this is pretty wild. I mean, a direct correlation between. IQ and attempts at suicide. So, you know, I mean, we can all say that anybody who tries to kill themselves is 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 stupid now. Without because <laughs> we, we couldn't say that before. I feel oh, I feel okay. validated now. I feel much better. 
That, yeah. was my, that was my hypothesis, but now you've backed that up with hard data. <laughs> Science agrees. People who try to kill themselves are stupid. But what did they make <laughs> any inference from that? As in the, the lower IQ, they can't process the information of life coming at them, so they tune out? Was there any any link as to the the causation of that, not the correlation? No, this is this was discovered by number crunchers. Okay. <laughs> They just looked at that. They had the data. They they put it all together. They don't really understand the association quite yet. It doesn't seem like. I mean, thinking about other things that I've read, it doesn't seem like that should be the association. There are other studies that say that um, the less intelligent, the, the lower somebody's IQ is, the the less likely they are to think that they're dumb. So if you're you're the lower your IQ, the smarter you think you are. Um, and Damn it, I was oh, just saying how smart I was. Really that's what I was. <laughs> God, darn it. I know. Hey, you and Oops. me both, Scott. Jeez. <laughs> Oops. And, and, and then with suicide, I mean, usually that's associated with depression, and depression is often associated with really creative, I mean, really creative uh, personalities sometimes, very volatile personalities, and that doesn't necessarily have, a, I mean, the volatility of a personality doesn't have a lot to do with IQ necessarily. Yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't put a Spalding Gray in the category of the low IQ suicide. No. But yeah, but according no. to this study, the majority were were in that category. But yeah, certainly, certainly your uh uber creative types who, you know, may 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 also have an increase in uh propensity for mental illness. Right. But these may not be mentally ill people. These may just be stupid people. <laughs> you know what I mean, part of, part of, I mean, there's, there's, I think there's probably a difference between being mentally ill and just being really dumb. There, you know, probably, I, there probably is a difference. Yeah. I have. What a I want feeling, to know is have, the correlation between intelligence, lack of intelligence, and the success failure ratio in killing yourself. You know, the guy walking around with three fingers left because the M80 didn't go off quite right. Uh, is, you know, it's stupid, tried it, but do smart people succeed more? I'd like to know more about this. And I'd like to also maybe know that's if, maybe they're, that's if their the, data set the came from the Darwin Awards and only the Darwin Awards. I, I think Scott's got it. I think, the, I think the data correlation where they collected it from, these are people who are hospitalized for the attempt. So <laughs> oh, what's not being counted is all the people who are successful who never made it to the <laughs> hospital because they were dead. They went to the morgue. So probably just, the numbers are just as equal for, for high IQs as low IQs in terms of attempt. <laughs> Write your but counter yeah, paper, success sir. Rate. You've got it. You've got it. There is there is the one one thing I one more thing I am thinking about this though is the suggestion that when you take antidepressants, it starts to help form more synapses. Because when you're depressed, your synapses start to wither. And so that as you become more depressed could facilitate the cycling of a lower IQ just because your brain isn't working as well. But IQ shouldn't be related to something like that. I don't... <sighs> yeah, I I'm mean, I'm over it. It's hard to say what all leads up to a situation like that. Um, <laughs> when you make your itinerary for a day, you know, <laughs> go to the store, get some more milk, do the laundry, blow my brains out. Okay. <laughs> ah, if I put that first, I really can skip the rest of that. <laughs> I'm going to skip all that other stuff. Oh, good gracious. Scott, I want to hear about this creature oddity. Well, um, uh, there, as reported in the Sci-Fi Wire uh, website, scifiwire.com, by Thomas Mill, an unidentified 30-centimeter monster was found near Kitchen Kitchen. Kichanumeku Sib in Guagwag, which is a problem because I actually phonetically spelled this out so I would sound smart for the show. And I can't even read the phonetic pronunciation. <laughs> now, here's where it gets interesting. Apparently, this creature already has known aliases, a.k.a. the bald beast of K.I., a.k.a. Omogenicus, which means something bad, a.k.a. the big trout lake monster, and a.k.a. the ugly one. That's my favorite. But basically, this is another one of these creatures that has hair loss, an animal that has some kind of hair loss and then dies and washes up on a shore, semi-bloated, like, uh, like the Montauk monster, and then uh, the, the press just loses their mind instead of 
right. bringing someone in to say, oh, let's let's analyze the skeletal structure and see what we have here. It's a crazy cryptid monster that nobody's <laughs> ever seen before. Now, granted, I write crazy cryptid monsters for a living in my books, but I guess that should be over in the, the land of, of fiction and not, not for real. But the only other key part of the story is if it's 30 centimeters long, that's that's not a monster unless it's like uh, critters, one through four. You guys remember those. <laughs> and even Stripe the Bad Gremlin was bigger than that. But yeah, yeah. Stripe by himself, that that's a problem. So it's 30 centimeters. It's got to be a lot of them, uh, not just one to qualify as a monster. It sounds like a possum. Uh, yeah. They think yeah. that if you read far enough down on cryptomundo.com, uh, they think it was a mink. A mink, just a really funky looking mink. Mink well, that had, was on a farm that was like, I'm shaving <laughs> and getting out. <laughs> I'm running. I'm running. All of the, I've, seen, all the I've seen how they did the other ones. <laughs> I'm going to get rid of this hair. This is going to let me go. Now I'm waiting <laughs> I'm for somebody to misqualify yeah. me because I've lost most of my hair as well. But so far, not quite as mean looking as this cat. Look at that bad boy. Um, but yeah. if you take a mean all looking mink up there on the screen. The Montauk monster, uh, the bald beast of KI. Yeah, once the animal loses most of the fur on its face, they're they're pretty freakish looking. So people want to look that up. Uh, it's the I still I think it's still the lead story at cryptomundo.com. So check that out. Yeah, I think you brought up a really interesting point though, really uh, about the just the circus that is. Oh, this crazy monster just looks funny, and we don't know what it is before having somebody figure out, you know, do what it, figure it out. I mean, you can do an, a DNA analysis, a pretty simple DNA hair analysis to find out what, it's, what, it's known kind of fascinating. Kind of hair, I mean, skeleton, teeth. I mean, there's so many mammologists around. This isn't even rocket science. You know, you just, you get, take the thing. The trouble is that people take pictures of it and then they don't try to preserve the creature in any way because they're kind of freaked out like, oh, it's a monster. So they run away. <laughs> And then the thing washes away or it decomposes or it conveniently disappears any any which way. And then all people are left with are these fairly poor pictures. But still, I mean, you, you just go to the hunters and trappers in any area, you're probably going to be 75% of the way there. Then you could actually take it to these crazy places of learning called a university and see how that turns out. But the, you have those in the, Canada? Oh, I, did I just offend the do. Canadian listeners? I'm sorry, guys. I believe they do. And they all study the maple leaf and one other subject. So the other subject <laughs> might be animals. So you could turn out well. That's right. Well, that's, it's pretty typical for dead things and decaying things to generate monsters. That's what they think that the, the vampire uh, mythology all originated from people going back into crypts. And in, uh, in Italy, they used to do a burial cloth where they'd put this cloth over people's face when they died. Well, when people die and the, and the flesh starts to recess, the teeth become more pronounced and the bacteria from the mouth um, would actually decay the cloth uh, quicker than anything else. So you'd have these, these mouths open with these, what looks like extended fangs out of all these dead corpses. And, and it, because also the bacteria, when it gets into the cloth, it has this very rusty red oxidi oxidizing effect that it looked like bloody red, like they were feeding Sometime oh in the gosh. night. That's a that's a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, them vampires are laugh right. I love them. They just crack my ass right up. That's right. They make me laugh. <laughs> they do. Yeah, uh, I read something recently. I don't remember. I think somebody actually sent me a link to an interesting blog post about these uh, crazy monsters and their now now with the advent of genetic sequencing and all sorts of stuff. We've got uh, the, like the Montauk, I think it's the Montauk monster. It was a big like slime blob thing that washed up on a beach that they, that they dug out of the sand. And there were several more of those that they've, since then, scientists have discovered that they're all um, like whales, decomposing whales that have died somewhere out in the ocean and just been uh -huh. decomposing and decomposing. And it's just their remains washing up on shore. Mm. Not monsters. That's Maybe they were so eaten boring. by... Giant squid. I know it's much, much yeah. less interesting than what our imaginations can do with it, right? <laughs> Have you noticed though? There's still no more word on the monkey cat. Uh, there's a monkey cat. 
The it's, monkey it's not cat. For, that's not for want of trying to find information on the monkey cat, though. I mean, you're searching constantly, Justin. The uh, the jungles, the deep jungles of Kalimantan, they set up some remote cameras to spot some wildlife out there. And they got uh, two or three kind of poor shots of a never before seen creature that kind of looked like a lemur, but they but had features that were very cat like and very uh, they're they're sure it's a predator, a carnivorous predator. Mm -hmm. So it looks it looks like half monkey, half cat from from the photos that uh, that they got back. That sounds suspiciously like something from South Park. If it has four butts, I would say that's from South Park. Kelly Mantan, it, that, that is kind of far enough away for a, a crazy it's genetic... It's an island that you could, you yeah. know, remove from... It actually, if it, morphologically Absolutely. speaking, um, the, the thing that I think it looks like is, is actually one of the early, early ancestors of the cat, of the feline family. It looks astonishingly like the the fossil record would would indicate if one of those things was alive today. But this is, it would have to have been surviving there for sixty five million years. <laughs> That's a good picture. <laughs> oh, there was a picture that just was popped up of a monkey and a cat. They, they were, they were the parents, friends. The parents of the, the Kalimantan monkey the... cat. <laughs> disclaimer! 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 <laughs> I don't believe there are any known unions of monkey and cat known to science. Uh, actually, Penthouse Letters, 1986, the April issue. <laughs> I don't know why I remember that, but I do. Okay, moving on. Uh, in the news, was there a mini black hole? Did scientists create a mini black hole in the laboratory? Kind of. Kind of, sort of, mm -hmm. but not, not mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Some Chinese researchers have been messing around with metamaterials, and they have created what they call... Uh, let me an omnidirectional electromagnetic absorber. I'd like to thank Ed Dyer for sending in this story. And they, they have compared it to an astrophysical black hole. So black holes in space soak up light and matter. This soaks up microwaves. But the interesting thing about it is they created these uh, this omnidirectional absorber. So it's circular and there are 60 strips of circuit board that are arranged in these layers, coated in copper, and they have these alternating patterns that resonate or they don't resonate in electromagnetic waves. And so normally, uh, the kinds of absorbers that have been created are all unidirectional. So they're not, I mean, it, it has to be directed at a particular source to get in, to get uh, to absorb and nullify electromagnetic rate radiation coming from one particular direction. But this sucks it up from all directions, just like a black hole. So, hey, they're excited about it. The next step in their plans is to actually create a device that will suck up visible light as well. I don't know what you all think about that, but as mm. soon as we start creating... That would be rad. Yeah, little spots of darkness in the laboratory. It kind of looks like something you get out of a Cracker Jacks box. I mean, just you know, a <laughs> little, little ring like that. That's a really fun toy, I think, to give to the kids. Have them take the mini black hole to school. Uh, <laughs> science experiment. There's a, it so, look. It solves the bully issue right off the bat. Right. That's not going to be a problem anymore. You slip the mini black hole, black hole under their desk. Problem solved. Uh, I don't know about getting rid of the light though. That's that's a little freaky. It is a little freaky. How much could it absorb? Where would it where, where would it go? Um, I mean, could you suck up? Would it just suck up the light as it goes into the one location? So in the way that like a black hole is a spot of darkness or would it be something that would just pull light into it from would it pull light into it from all directions or would it just absorb light that hit it from any direction I mean, that would be an, and could you an could you question. store the light and then like use that energy later that's an interesting question that would be rad <laughs> an absorber and then emitter that would be the best yeah. flashlight ever yeah. So then you could, or just, you know, you get a collection of them and you have them absorb light, you know, you use them as buttons or whatever, just walking around your day to day, they absorb enough light. And then you like throw them in a coal burning furnace, <laughs> like burn the black holes for their energy. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe it would solve the, maybe we could take these mini black holes and make them out of all the cadmium that the Chinese manufacturers are using. And there you go. Everything kind of works itself up. 
<laughs> that would be good. They're, they're Stop toy. poisoning they're people just, with cadmium. They're just That's another good. toy manufactured in China. That's what's going on. They're only slightly <laughs> dangerous if you play with them for more than 10 minutes. So it's totally fine. Don't worry about it. And on that note, kids, we're going to take it to the break. This has been This Week in Science, and we will be back in just a few moments. Stay tuned. And Twist would like to thank Audible.com for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Science. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 75,000 different titles in a variety of genres. Twist has found many science-based books in the Audible library. And uh, you can take our pick of, of the week, for example. I was gonna, actually, I was going to say From Eternity to Here by Sean Carroll, because that is our Twist Book Club Book of the Month. And make a great choice for you to listen to if you can listen to it and then discuss amongst the book clubbers of the twist the twist group um scott is you you do your own audio stuff is your is is ancestor coming out on audible it will be on audio so i've done my own audiobook recordings for about five years yeah. Just giving away giving away his podcast and now i was able to go in and record ancestor in a an actual big boy studio Cool. And then that will be the audio book that will be out on CD uh, June 22nd. And the download will be available as well from Audible. So should be good. Wonderful. Okay, so you can't download it right now, but maybe we'll make it our, our pick of the week for in a couple of weeks when it's when it's released. So we'll yep. hold on to that one, but we'll look for it. Uh, yeah, so the thing about audible.com is that they offer you a free audio book download if you sign up for a for a membership. Even for a free trial, you can try it out. You don't, you don't lose anything. You get a free book. You sign up, get a book, and you can make our pick of the week, Eternity, uh, From Eternity to Here by Sean Carroll, your pick of the week this week. And join in the fun because it's the beginning of the month and you have the rest of the month to read the book and discuss it with the Twist Book Club. So you can give that a try. All you have to do is sign up at audiblepodcast.com forward slash twist. And... Uh, uh, yeah, that's about it. So go to audiblepodcast.com forward slash twist right now for your free download. And we're back. This is This Week in Science. Thanks for staying tuned, everybody. We are joined this week by our guest contributor, Scott Sigler. He's a best-selling New York Times author and the author of a book set to arrive in bookstores in just a couple of weeks on June 22nd, right? Called Ancestor. Yep. Ancestor's out June 22nd in hardcover. Probably most bookstores just about everywhere in the U.S. and Canada. Excellent. So we discussed this book a couple of years ago, uh, which and it's about the creation of a synthetic life life form that kind of goes horribly awry in a really <laughs> interesting manner. Uh, we discussed it a couple of years ago on Twist when it was first released. What's changed? What's the big story between then and now, Scott? Well, that was uh, I first gave it away as a podcast in 2005, and then uh, the podcast picked up popularity, so we were able to put it out as a book uh, with a real small Canadian imprint, it's Canadians again, and uh, it did extremely well on Amazon, and that led to a book deal with Crown Publishing, which is a division of Random House. Part of that book deal was picking up Ancestor and uh, the first book I did called Earthcore and bringing them out. So now here we are five years later, and cover's changed. Yeah. yeah, it looks pretty, I like it. There's a big monster on there. It's a baby monster, so it's less than 30 centimeters. So do, this one you do need to be afraid of because it's going to grow. So um, things that have changed, the I have 
just become in five years, I'm, I'm a better writer. So was able to go through and, and just make the book overall a better story and was able to bring in, uh, you know, tr try and get more accurate with the science. I try and make my science as accurate as possible and still be able to tell a bitchin' story. So as accurate as possible uh, within the, the context of a sci-fi story. And this time, uh, I call it the, a peer-reviewed horror novel. I had three biology PhDs go through and read, read the thing at first draft, then second draft, then third draft, and rip parts of it right out and say, that's just not going to work. And they were giving me ideas and other parts. And so those of those who, who know biology and science would probably get quite a big kick out of it because it's, it's about as close as you can get, I think. I think that's really exciting that it's uh, that you've gone that you went through the trouble. I mean, I, I know when it first came out, you were getting advice from your listeners and putting out chapters, audio chapters and getting feedback. But this is even more extreme. This is really peer reviewed to make it the science, the science right. So it and then take the fiction just that one step further. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. to me, that's what really makes it um, really makes it enjoyable. Now, a lot of people like uh, supernatural fiction, ghost goblins, vampires, werewolves, what have you. Um, I like those stories, but I, I always, as I'm reading those stories, I'm kind of also taken out of it at the same time because there's usually no rule set. So in my books, the rule set is the science that we all know and love in our modern day world. And by setting that up as the background for the story, it really lets you kind of uh, let yourself go and dive further into the story and, and, and just immerse yourself in what's happening and enjoy it a bit more. And I also think hopefully it makes it scarier. So when the scary parts hit, you've already bought in because I've been feeding you information that you already know and you've studied and you've learned about. And then all of a sudden things go horribly wrong and they do go, they do go horribly wrong in this one. Yeah. Do you think that's recently, right. I, mean, I love, I love science fiction that has science as part of it. Cause that's, <laughs> That's how it, the, like the golden age of science fiction really tried to do that. They tried to take the things that we were being introduced to in the world of science and use them in the storytelling. And it, you know, but and it's, it's always still looking back, always fun to see how much uh, it was still part of the age. Mm -hmm. Like this, the spaceships uh, in the future all had uh, all had sounds like. Uh, like a submarine, <laughs> the intercoms, and they had mm -hmm. they had the radar that did the, the boop boop sounds and all of that. But uh, yeah, I, I I love I love science fiction that does try to incorporate what we actually know about science and not just make it up a complete fantasy universe to, well, that, to play it out. And, that, and that's what we get in in most movies that are out now is you take a word or a phrase like black hole or genetic engineering and then you know, make up whatever the hell you want. And it's a little bit harder for movies, granted, because telling a story in, in 90 minutes or 120 minutes, you really can't go back and list the bibliography. You know, it's it's not an easy art form. Uh, but at the same time, like Splice, which just came out, really I just took the I haven't seen that yet, but... Uh. Uh, well, I mean, it took the high level, it took a high level concept and then told a, a moralistic tale surrounding it and then tried to end it up with science going horribly wrong so that people will come see it in the theaters. Um, when you write a novel that's 400 pages, you've got, you've got a lot more room to actually take, well, this is happening right now. This is the science that's happening right now and we can work that into a novel. And like Justin said, that makes it very exciting and thrilling because there's a lot of stuff that you already know and the story stays true to that, but then there's this cutting edge information and, and and it makes it new and exciting. And yeah, you'll wonder you wonder how accurate it'll be in another ten or fifteen years. How have you felt recently with the uh, with the J. Craig Venter synthetic biology announcements and everything? Do you just feel like uh, there's a certain you're definitely following parallel tracks with the way the research has been developing in in synthetic engineering? It's it's really close to what I write about in Ancestor, at least. Yeah. Uh, at the high level or the, the theoretical concept and the concept of we can digitize genomes. We can, you know, even like the work of um, uh, David Hausler at uh, UC Santa Cruz to actually be able to figure out some of the genome of the ancestor of all mammals by kind of sequencing multiple mammal genomes and reverse engineering it. 
And the concept of ancestors, that very much that work. Well, if we can digitize this and sequence it in a computer, what happens when we figure out what's missing in the computer and then can just print out the DNA? And uh, a great quote I wrote down from, uh, from Venter from their recent announcement that he made uh, was is super exciting for me because it's exactly what goes on in the book. And that is, quote, uh, in essence, scientists are digitizing biology by converting the A, C, T, and Gs of the chemical makeup of DNA into ones and zeros in a computer, but one can reverse the process and start with ones and zeros in a computer to define the characteristics of a living cell. Uh, that's the question that they sent out to answer, uh, Venter sent out to answer. Um, so yeah, super exciting as an author. I've been working on this book for over 10 years. It's yeah. been out in a couple different forms. And now to watch right when it's coming out in hardcover and we'll be in the front tables and all the stores to see, uh, you know, Venter basically prove at a very small element, prove the concept that's in the book. It's, it's awesome. It's thrilling. Yeah, that's got to be so exciting. So the book's coming out uh, June 22nd. It's called Ancestor. Yep. Um, and let's get let's get back into the the sciencey news stuff. You had a story that ties right into this about the uh, about life technologies and what's going on with uh, with Craig Venter. Well, um, Craig Venter and Life Life Technologies uh, is investing. They don't know how much they're investing, but um, excuse me, Synthetic Genomics is Craig Venter's company, and Life Technologies is a company that is worth has three point three billion dollars annually in sales. And this reads like one of my books. Uh, they make DNA sequencers, man-made DNA, and other cutting-edge biotech products. I like the man-made DNA part myself. And they have an equity investment in synthetic genomics. They won't say how much it is, but Exxon's already invested $300 million in synthetic genomics. And everybody wants to get in on this all of a sudden. If we start making all of these different artificial bits and pieces, it, it, you make it wonder where it'll go. And the really fun thing is anyone who's ever watched a horror movie knows that scientists do bad things when they're under a lot of pressure to make money, and yep. especially when they're under pressure from another company that's pursuing the same line of research. That's when, that's when the crap hits the fan. And uh, there is another company called uh, Illumina that is working on synthetic DNA, and Life Technologies is behind them. So Life Technologies has to scramble to catch up. I think faces will be melting very soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. your prediction, huh? Justin, what do you think? <laughs> All I have to add to that is that uh, man-made DNA isn't really beyond our reach. It's not. No. no. Oh. We've, we've got it. But it I sure do it all cool. the time. Yeah. <laughs> So that's my news story. I just think that, uh, yeah, if you just change a couple words from uh, Venter to Dr. Frankenstein, it sounds much more interesting. Life Technologies invests in Dr. Frankenstein to make man-made DNA. That's there a book, you baby. go. Yeah, that that's is. It, it really is right the Dr. Frankenstein story of the of the modern era. Absolutely. Yep. yep. And of course, uh, it's you know, it's science. So. As everyone who doesn't follow science knows, science is bound to go horribly wrong. We're bound <laughs> to wind up with monsters and probably uh, a plague and a black hole because it'll somehow be tied into the LHC and, and we're just all going to die. Terrible. Yeah, it, it all, they, they'll all culminate together in the, yeah, the black hole, the LHC and monsters. Yeah, Every, pretty much what all, you want is a story where place. you're running away from a black hole, being chased by monsters. Then you shelter yourself at the LHC, and, and that's where the big showdown happens. That's the last 20 minutes of the film and the end of the world. <laughs> I am looking forward to that one. Or did we see that in 2012? I think that might have been. I think that might have already happened. I think with the uh, the life technology stuff, it's um, you're you're totally right about the the money aspect of of pushing it forward. But you know, making a joke out of it and calling it Doctor Frankenstein is funny at it as it is. It can also be. It, you know, people are already kind of afraid of this technology. People don't know what to think of it. The media is already all over it. Headlines saying artificial life. Um, you know, the, the Dr. Frankenstein term has been trotted out a few times. Uh, I, I just wonder, I just wonder, you know, if that goes too far. You know, there are a lot of people who, who just won't think of it as a joke kind of thing. And I mean, I don't know. I personally think if people are afraid of it, it'll do, be better because maybe more regulations will be in place to actually 
direct the research and control the research. And so the money might not have as much of an, of an influence, but I don't know. I don't know. If, if, if we create life, I don't know what, what we can uh, continue to call artificial about it at that point. Yeah, that, that does become a, a bit of a slippery slope as far as the definition goes. I mean, if it's alive and it's, and it's replicating and it's self-sustaining, mm-hmm. like Dutch's bacteria yeah. is now, then, I mean, it's, it's alive. Every, every kind of life had to start somewhere. We just happen to be the direct ancestors of this, uh, this crazy newfangled thing. Yep. If anyone just tuned in, you're listening to This Week in Science. Justin, did you have a story? Anything upbeat? <clears throat> Less like end of the world? Uh, no end of the <laughs> world in sight. <laughs> but there is a lawless blob wreaking havoc in the universe. Oh, dear. It's uh, destroying some of the basic, uh, basic things that uh, the physicists have said are constants throughout the universe. And this is very going to be very upset to a handful of physicists. Uh, it is it is supposed to be it is supposed that if the, there are certain constants in the weight of of an uh, of an electron and the way that magnetic fields work, that certain things in the universe are constants, and if any of them were tweaked even just a little bit, the whole universe would fly apart. That uh, the universe in which we live could not even have come into existence. And then that's true. That's very true <laughs> until uh, evidence comes from an observation of a dense ga- uh, gas cloud some 2.9 billion light years away, which has a handy radio source, which is a very active, supermassive black hole uh, that's right behind it. So what we get to see is the absorption rate of this, this big blob of particles that's between us and this black hole that's emitting the, uh, the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the radio waves. So basically when they're looking at this, the, the radio waves should behave in a certain way and, and there should be a certain rise and dip in the spectrum based on uh, having passed through there. However, the frequency gap between uh, the upper and the lower dip, <laughs> just to put it simply, because if I get more specific, I won't even understand it, is not what they would expect. So, so far, the, the, first, the first thing that this means is that either they don't know what they're looking at and there's other, there's other uh, something causing a massive interference out there in the universe, or the laws of physics are not the same everywhere in the universe. Or, dun, dun, dun. or yeah, which is, <laughs> oh, that would be awesome if we could determine that, right? Because that it, mean, it means that basically all the local laws, because all the laws of physics, most of the laws of physics have been determined locally. Yeah. You know, within, our, within our planet first, then in our you know, atmosphere and solar system, we have the laws of physics. And it seems miraculous that we can track the, the wobble of Mercury, you know, based on the physics that we learned here on Earth and observations. But that's still right here in our solar system. Talking about the universe, we've, you know gained most of our physics from a very specific, isolated little area. And, you know, some of the observations do help in the long range. Um, (laughs) But one of the other arguments here is that uh, potentially, since this is 2.9 billion light years away, we're also looking at something that was 2.9 billion years ago. So perhaps... Because it's such a slight, slight uh, discrepancy uh, that it could also mean that as the universe ages, uh, the fundamental constants of the universe are aging as well. They could be changing slowly. So that idea says everything everywhere in the universe started out with the same constants and they're all changing in lockstep and in sync as we age. Or... or the one, and the one I really like is the idea that the, the constants of the universe are not the same everywhere. Is anyone else's eyes mm. bleeding from this? Just, <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, oh, to, to all of the, yeah, I'm out. I, this is so far beyond me. I can't even. Can't even. So, so there is no constant. There's not even like a no. constant and switch to measure the other variable constants. So it's all just, it's all Plato, really. Subjective. 
Yeah, it's, it could be compl- we could be living in a completely subjective version of the universe right here, assuming that everything outside of our solar system <laughs> works the same way as it does here, right? Mm. But I mean, this is I mean, because what <laughs> this uh, the one of the constants that's uh, at risk here is the ratio of the uh, mass of a proton to the mass of an electron. <laughs> like that could be that's at that, risk. That's a pretty significant. That's, um, that's massive. Yeah. Yeah. Every atom. <laughs> Protons, but, neutrons, yeah, electrons. That, that's going to measure the, the response to the magnetic field, and yeah. the, that's into the fine structure of the constant alpha, which governs the strength of electromagnetic force. And if these, uh, what this is telling us is that things could be very slightly different, but enough so that it kind of throws the kilter all the things that physicists have told us for years. Which is if, don't don't touch the buttons. Don't touch <laughs> if you turn any of the buttons. The whole universe will fly apart. We can't uh. survive with. You turn the volume up over here, move the slider over there, we all die. That's what we've been told. And it turns out that might not be true. And so such a small variation, well, it wouldn't really affect how far the, you know, the corner liquor store is from your house. It will, uh, it, it will make them uh, have to change everything that we know about physics, which is really cool. It's great. That, yeah. Rewriting everything about physics, that's exactly what is going to keep physicists employed for the next hundred million years. Perfect. Mm. So you're saying this is a conspiracy then? That's what you're saying. <laughs> they're, they're changing the rules to get funding. I see how it goes. That's right. That's, yes. how, that's how science works, Actually, that right? is kind of cool. Science is the only, only, only job you can have where every time you get something wrong, <laughs> it's, not, it's a better opportunity for employment. <laughs> well, no, we got that. <laughs> you know? We must ask more questions. We must. We've got to do it. Uh, I had one really, really quick last story before we get to the end of the hour here. Um, it has nothing to do with all these uh, wonderfully crazy blobs and, um, you know, death rays and black holes and other things we've been discussing. I guess we haven't talked about death rays yet, but we could have. Um, So our ancestors, I'm going back in time here instead of into the future, our ancestors were not vegetarians between 1.9 and 2 million years ago. The brain size of our ancestors increased dramatically and brought us to the time now that we have our wonderfully complex and large cortex that allows us to think about things like the constants that keep our universe together. Um, So the boost in brain power and size, the question has been, where does that come from? And one of the leading hypotheses has been that it came from a fish diet. However, there wasn't a lot or enough evidence to really uh, give that credence. However, Brian Richmond, uh, he's in an anthropologist, uh, he's an anthropologist at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., He has published a study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that supports the fish hypothesis and that they they could have eaten enough to actually do that. They found bone fossils, uh, 500 bone fragments found in northern Kenya, and they had cut marks from early stone tools. And there were some bite marks too from uh, not as many bite marks as stone tool marks. And they are the oldest evidence that we currently have of consumption of aquatic animals by our human ancestors. Brian Richmond says a diet that includes animal tissue, especially ones rich in brain growth nutrients like fish, crocodiles, and turtles, lifts the constraints on brain growth. And this is the. Crocodiles? And crocodiles. Yes. I guess fish, crocodiles, and turtles lift the constraints on brain growth because they have wonderful fatty acids. Those fatty acids our brain loves to suck up. (laughs) The earliest evidence of a substantial contribution of these kinds of foods into the diet of our early human ancestors, and it occurs before the evidence of larger brains. So fish, crocodiles, turtles in the diet, little brains, suddenly bigger brains, and now we're eating at McDonald's. Um, <laughs> but you can get fish in the gun. That's, I mean, I get to play a fish. I get two of them, actually. And uh, you knock those back. I'm ready to take any IQ test you want to put in front of me. I'll whoop it. Would you commit suicide? You know, um, fortunately, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to eat the filet of fish to raise the IQ oh, okay. so that I won't be in the hospital after a failed uh, suicide attempt. I'm trying still, to get it right. I'm still, I'm still cracking up at that. <laughs> still, I'm still stuck on just the story, yeah. We we talked to the people who who screwed up killing themselves. 
And that's what we're basing our evaluation of IQ on. Awesome. Awesome. I'm sorry, uh, let's see. My bad, so, my bad. What? My bad. Back to the fish. Go crazy. <laughs> Back to the fish. I'm, just, I'm actually still stuck on the fact that there was a group of, of ancestors that we may have had that fed on crocodile. Crocodiles like, and turtles. And did they not make they, they also found bones of antelope, rhinoceros, and hippopotamus and uh, catfish. Hippopotamus. That's like hard to take down now. Yeah, hippopotamus bones. Yummy hippopotamus. Mm, good for my brain. Yeah, so the question is, you know, which came first, the food or the brain? Did the fish actually have something to do with it? And I'm wondering now, what does this mean for vegetarians like me? Are our brains being stunted because we don't eat meat? I mean, I don't think so with the food that we have available right now. But um, you have to wonder what diet is best for your brain or even for society. There's a study by that Verena Fuchs sent in um, from Psychology Today uh, originally published in PLOS One that did an fMRI study of vegetarians versus vegans versus omnivores and found that the areas of the brain most related to empathy uh, were more active in vegetarians and vegans than in omnivores when they were shown pictures of uh, terrible things being done to humans and animals. So vegans and vegetarians are more empathic. Empathetic? empathic anyway so it might not be uh better for my brain to be a veggie but maybe i can just get along better i can just get along does does that does the empathy though make make you more um prone to be a victim when the lhc does collapse the universe and we go to kind of a post-apocalyptic setting where yeah, are you will, gonna be then will will i be the first to die that's the question <laughs> or, however, here's the other question that's related. Uh, these days, are most vegans packing heat? Are you, you know, see, do you have your concealed weapons permit? Are you ready to to defend your vegan principles? I I am not packing heat personally, but I, I have I have used a gun, so if I got my hands on one, I, I know what to do with it. Okay, and then if there are right. any hippopotamuses, you can take them out and get smarter. It's perfect. I'll get them. Perfect. Take it out. And if and if the and if the grid goes down, so society collapses. I'll be uh, completely useless with a weapon. <laughs> However, I do know how to make beer. <laughs> that so, is, <laughs> that's that's a good skill. So protect, right up there with like the exchange of goods and services. Cost. Yeah, exchange of goods and services. You will have no problem. I think you'll be fine. Yeah. It's right I will up have there. A, like I will be a king. I will have screws. a harem. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. All right, everybody. It's time for the end of another episode of Twists. On next week's show, it's going to be Justin and Allie who are holding down the fort, I think. I'm going on vacation. So um, they get to have fun while I'm away playing in the sun. Unless, of course, I can find a good internet connection where I'm vacationing. So we'll see. The June book of the month, as I had said, is From Here to Eternity by Sean Carroll. So in the meantime, you can go to twistbookclub.com, uh, twistbookclub.ning.com to talk about this month's book with the Twist Book Club peeps. And uh, I guess, yeah, I'd like to give shout outs to everyone who wrote in this last week. Thanks so much for all your letters, for your, um, for your comments, and for the stories. Wouldn't be the same without you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We uh, hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is uh, available via podcast. You can go to our website, www.twist.org. Click on a button that says to subscribe to the podcast there. Or you can just Google us in the iTunes, and you'll find our podcast in there. Or you can even look for us. Uh, we have a droid out there somewhere. Ooh, we also got our show. <laughs> and thank, uh, you guys, thank you guys for having me on. Uh, always a pleasure to be on the show. I've been listening to you for many years now. So uh, it's kind. Of, it's always cool to be on here, and I appreciate it. Yeah, I was going to say thank you so much for joining us. I'm, it was very fun to have you on and have uh, have Absolutely. the stories that you brought and the ideas that you brought to the show. It was exciting, and I'm happy and stupid for your jokes. book. I brought stupid <laughs> jokes too, which are always always in short supply. I think we all, we always need more stupid jokes. It's always good. Smart jokes and stupid jokes, but stupid jokes, definitely. And Ancestor, once again, is going to be on bookshelves available June 22nd. June 22nd. And we have an awesome uh, trailer that we spent a lot of time 
uh, putting together. And people can go to scottsigler.com slash ancestor. They can watch that trailer. We tried to make it as cinematic quality as possible. We hiked up into the mountains, into the snow and everything. So go check that out and everybody see if the, the book is up your alley. Hard science horror. You don't get a lot of that. So enjoy. And once again, scottsigler.com is the website and we will have links available for people who are interested on our website. And uh, you can go to our website as well, twist.org, for more information on show notes, stories, et cetera, links, lots of those things. And we do want to hear from you, so email us. Email me at Kirsten at, Ju- uh, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Kirsten at Justin.com. <laughs> there we go. It's a new web. It's great. New show. <laughs> or you can email Justin at Justin at thisweekinscience.com. Or you can get us on the Twitter. We have uh, Dr. Kiki or Jackson Fly. Either one of those will find us there. Uh, we do want to hear from you if you have a suggestion for a story, if you have got a person you think we should interview, or if you just want to give us an insider stock tip about your company that's about to do something really cool and we can make a lot of money off of if we got in early, let us know. And some of us will will be back here next week. And we hope that you will join us again for more great fun with science news. And if you learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. That's another show in the can, folks. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a super show, guys. Awesome. Super fun. That was a lot of fun. I hope you guys liked it. Totally. Did you enjoy it? I I love being on the show. It's awesome. It's (laughs) great. I was. My brain was starting to shut down on the whole constant story, though. I, I get palpitations. I can only take so much of that. When what little reality we know is, oh, yeah, reality isn't really there at all. I'm like, oh, geez. Yeah, we're just in a bubble. We are just in just the bubble. Self-referencing bubble universe. Oh, I have trouble with, like, basic math. When they start to get into that.